Peace to you all in the heart of Jesus and welcome to my YouTube channel in Montum Sanctum. I'm going to begin uh, today a series of talks uh, entitled uh, Recovery of the Spiritual Tradition of Prayer where we take a journey together and see uh, in, from the earliest days of the church, the Christian communities, experience of prayer and the various ways of praying and the various schools of prayer. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the Desert Fathers. In the early days of the church, uh, the uh, to be a Christian meant that you would be most likely uh, caught and uh, uh, punished by the Roman state. In fact, from about the year uh, 249 AD under the Emperor Decius and later under other emperors, Christians were put to death. Uh, many of them in the most uh, horrific manner. In fact, um, some of the martyrs, early martyrs that were held up uh, for uh, examples of fidelity we find in uh, the, the canon of the mass. Um, so uh, so um, let's remember that uh, this tradition of which we're speaking about and particularly in prayer, is what we call a living tradition. It's not something um, of the past, it's uh, ever present. The experience of uh, the Christian community is a living reality now. But we want to take a, um, uh, we want to take an, a historical journey uh, uh, to uh, remember uh, the ways of prayer. Uh, we, we go at, at a time in the church when now we're talking um, uh, before the 5th century uh, when there was no division in the church uh, between a East and West. Uh, so as we know later on the um, uh, there was a division between the Latin Rome uh, uh, and the the east uh, Constantinople, hmm. um, and also later, of course, the uh, great chasm uh, caused uh, the Reformation um, between uh, Catholic and Protestant. We're talking about what we might call the undivided tradition of the Church. So. By the end of the third century, when we do have at last a Roman Emperor, Constantine, who uh, gave tolerance to Christianity and later became a Christian himself, uh, the uh, Christians were able to come out of hiding and to practice their faith openly. And later they were, of course, given great encouragement. Um, in fact, uh, under the Emperor Constantine, the uh, religion that obviously became uh, the religion of the Roman uh, Empire. But there's always a danger, of course, uh, when um, Christians become too... Um, established and respectable um, um, because um, they take things for granted. In other words, that uh, in the reign of the Emperor Constantine, uh, many Christians after a while became rather lax in, in their faith. Well, you have to understand uh, that uh, although there were many great uh, uh, advances in the uh, spread of the gospel at that time with the greater freedom and uh, the uh, 
Christian community in some respects um, took things for granted. And against the background of this, uh, many m m men and some women um, decided that they wanted to return to live a more austere and authentic Christian life uh, by withdrawing uh, from uh, populated areas. In fact, they went out into the desert. They did so because they could be free uh, from all the, the worldly distractions around them in their society. Um, <clears throat> and the desert area in which they uh, withdrew was the around the uh, in Egypt, the Egyptian uh, uh, Delta region, Syria, North Palestine. They uh, went uh, to uh, renew uh, their life of prayer by identifying themselves with, uh, of course, the master and teacher of all prayer, our Lord himself, who, in the Gospels, um, withdrew into the desert uh, in his temptations to do battle uh, with Satan. And these men and women also uh, saw their withdrawal uh, in the terms of a spiritual combat with the demons. Uh, this is witnessed by a, a, a monk called uh, Hezekiah, who uh, wrote a treatise on the Christian life entitled on striving and praying. Uh, so there was one fundamental reason for going into the desert, not just to escape the world, uh, but to, to do a real battle uh, with the demons uh, who were believed to live in the tombs and uh, uninhabited regions of the desert. This is clear from the life of St. Anthony, the great St. Anthony. He's called often Grantony the Great or indeed Anthony of Egypt. And uh, his life was written by another saint uh, later, uh, St. Athanasius. I'm going to show you now a pic, an icon of St. Anthony of Egypt. There you are. St. Anthony was, in a, a sense, the uh, founder of uh, the monastic life, which developed later from the more primitive uh, expression uh, beginning uh, in the desert. Um, when Anthony the Great retires, for example, into the cave, he is attacked by demons. And it is the demons, not Antony, who cry out, Leave us alone. Why do you trouble us? And so one of the most uh, common features of the desert was the existence uh, um, of spiritual disciples. So you have uh, the Abba, i.e. the father, the spiritual guide, and gradually in time um, his reputation grew for holiness and spiritual direction, and so those who wanted to live such a life um, uh, came and sought the Abba out in his uh, place uh, in the desert of isolation. So what happened then was that these disciples um, a, a small number probably lived uh, not with the Abba but in close proximity. See, you, you see the beginning of the foundation of a, a monastic community life. But this is really a very primitive stage and expression. 
So uh, the novices, as it were, those who are seekers coming to the Abba, wanted a word of instruction from the Father. Hence, uh, we, uh, uh, there we have um, a collection of sayings of the Abba or fathers of the desert. The, the, fathers, the sayings of the fathers of the desert and they are short pithy sayings in which the disciple would go away uh, and meditate and reflect upon. Um, and today you can um, read these sayings, there are many editions of the sayings of the desert fathers, for example um, there's um, an edition edited by Helen Waddell there's also a more up-to-date uh, collection of sayings uh, that have been translated uh, by um, Benedict Ward, and with a foreword by uh, the Metropolitan and Metropolitan Anthony. Um, I'll just show you quickly uh, the uh, the Benedict Ward uh, edition. So these pithy sayings of spiritual instruction were gathered therefore into collections of sayings and were written down um, um. having withdrawn to the solitary life Arsenius prayed Lord give me a word by which I may be saved and he heard a voice saying to him, Arsenius, flee, be silent, pray always, for these are the source of sinlessness. So these uh, words by which one might be saved uh, were very often, as I said, cryptic and often not words at all but they were rather, shall we say, acted out parables, just often how our Lord used to teach, as uh, in, uh, we see in the Gospels. Uh, when the novice, uh, so the novice was to think about and interpret these sayings of the fathers to, for themselves. I'll give you, so I will quote, <clears throat> There were three brothers who wanted to devote themselves more seriously to living the Christian life. One decided to go and look after the sick. One preferred to become a peacemaker. And the third went into the desert. After a time, the first two were becoming rather disillusioned. Their attempts to do good were meeting with little success. So they went off to visit the brother who had become a monk. He acted out a little parable. He took a jug of water and poured the water into a bowl and made them look into it. The surface of the water was all ruffled and reflected nothing. A few minutes later, he made them look into it again. This time the surface was smooth and they could see their own faces reflected uh, in it. So explained the brother to them, unless you become tranquil, you cannot know yourself. The, the implicit moral of this story is that without self-knowledge you cannot expect to, to be able to help others. From this way of life arose the tradition of the spiritual father, the Abba, as I said, whom the disciple, the novice, um, submitted to absolutely. 
Nyabo was the one who guided, corrected and encouraged the young seeker. The spiritual father ensured that the novice remained um, uh, flexible in his efforts and that he was freed from self-deception. As the Abba uh, Barsin, uh, Barsinophus Ophius writes, do not give yourself to absolute regulation because it will only lead you into conflict and anxieties. Instead, probe what is at hand at each moment. In the fear of God and not in any contentious spirit, doing your best to be free from anger. Give yourself no regulations. Be obedient and humble and demand an account of yourself each day. The prophet indicated that this day by day principle were the words, I said and now I have begun. And so did Moses when he said, Now, O Israel, you too should hold fast to the now. When you read some of the sayings of the Desert Fathers and the accounts of the Fathers, sometimes uh, in some of their actions they appear to go to uh, extraordinary feats of asceticism. But the, the main uh, tenor of the uh, teaching of the Desert Fathers is utter simplicity. Simplicity, And uh, that simplicity is uh, open to every Christian, to you and to me. The price of self-knowledge. In other words, if we uh, know our... The more we know ourselves more deeply with all our failings and foibles the more we can allow our self-knowledge of the self-knowledge of god to penetrate our inmost being the price of self-knowledge was the pain of shall we say being still of staying for the disciple in his cell or his cave in the desert and not uh, being tempted to move about from place to place. And find the final um, uh, total aim uh, of course of the spiritual life for all of us and we're talking now about the Desert Fathers was love, is love. It is this feature that uh, marks most of the teaching of the Desert Fathers because although perhaps they were often um, demanding uh, of their spiritual disciples, there was a simplicity and uh, a perception of how to direct the disciple according to their own spiritual needs. And, uh, but this love and simplicity is all also um, uh, exhibited in uh, compassion and hospitality. Uh, quote, A brother of Skeet happened to commit a fault, and the elders assembled and sent for Abbot Moses to join them. He, however, did not want to come. So, uh, uh, the priest sent him a message saying, Come, the community of the brethren is waiting for you. So he arose and started off, and taking with him a very old basket full of holes, he filled it with sand and carried it behind him. The elders came out to meet him and said, What is this, Father? The elder replied, My sins are running out behind me, and I do not see them, 
and today I come to judge the sins of another brother. They hearing this said nothing to the brother but pardoned him. Wonderful. So this sense of compassion and humility of the heart uh, is extended to all things, to all creation, to all creatures. And it leads to what we call the prayer of tenderness. The vibrating at the touch of the Holy Spirit. A quote now again from one of the fathers, the Isaac the Syrian. When a man with such a heart as his thinks of the, of the creatures and looks at them, his eyes are filled with tears because of the overwhelming compassion that presses upon his heart. The heart of such a man grows tender and he cannot endure to hear or, or look upon any an injury even the smallest suffering inflicted upon anything in creation. Therefore, he never ceases to pray with tears, even for the dumb animals, for the enemies of truth, and for all who do harm to it, asking that they be guarded and receive God's mercy. And the reptiles also he prays with great compassion, uh, which rises up endlessly in his heart after the example of God. The, the Desert Father's view of all creation, of all creatures, of humanity is of tenderness and compassion. So what is their view of humanity? Well, of course, as we know in Genesis, we know that man is made in the image and likeness of God. And uh, as St. Augustine says, What is it that is joined upon the soul that it should know itself? I suppose that it may consider itself and live according to its nature, that is, the image of God. God has created us in his own image, and our hearts are restless until they rest in him. Now, in the tradition of the Desert Fathers, uh, there are four principles of the spiritual life. We won't find in, in their sayings a, uh, um, a discursive and systematic uh, treatise on prayer. Now, that will be something in the later tradition, when the experience, primitive uh, experiences uh, more meditated upon more fully. But here we're talking about the a collection of sayings uh, of the fathers. Remember uh, the, the father gave perhaps a word or, or a sentence for the disciple to meditate upon or maybe a physically acted out a parable. And uh, so with penance, prayers and tears and fasting and saying um, uh, um, so the Jesus prayer, which is uh, something that uh, is uh, certainly very much a living part of Eastern uh, uh, <coughs> Christianity uh, today, whether uh, not in communion with Rome or in communion with Rome. It's uh, those words uh, from the Gospel. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, a sinner. 
or more elaborated, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy upon me. That's a prayer that is said over and over again until it sinks deep into the heart. Um, so, I think today uh, I will conclude, but I want to develop in the next talk part two uh, to discuss more deeply uh, the four uh, spirit, four principles of the spiritual life, as uh, uh, enunciated, if you like, by uh, the desert tradition, the desert fathers. I hope uh, uh, you have found this uh, talk interesting, and uh, please, uh, if you haven't already done so, please click the subscribe button when you uh, watch this video on my YouTube channel. May God increase in us all uh, the faith that he has planted within us, that it may grow uh, and may uh, blossom in the desert. Peace to you, my brothers and sisters. In nomine Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, Amen.